Hi, welcome to powering an interactive SVG and JavaScript game engine with Drupal. It's a little bit of a mouthful to say. Um, this is meant to be a case study of a project that we worked on that used Drupal to power a, a game engine that our client was able to use to develop uh, a testing platform for students. <clears throat> I'm Peter Weber. I'm a friend and engineer at Design Group. We're based in Denver, Colorado. Um, on D.io and Twitter, I'm Zerpreneur, and you can email me at peter at adam.io. Uh, I built my first Drupal site in 2008, and it is still out there screaming for security updates right now. <laughs> um, my first DrupalCon was in 2012, and so it's a real honor for me to be speaking here today. <clears throat> um, Ad Design Group is a digital strategy design and development agency, and we're based out of Denver, Colorado. We use Drupal and other open source technologies. Uh, we do user-centered design, agile development, and collaboration to help organizations tell their story and connect with their users. We partner with a lot of amazing clients, like Human Rights Watch, uh, the University of Denver, Guttmacher, and many other nonprofits, educational institutions, museums. Uh, we try to work with organizations that are doing work that matters. <clears throat> so this case study is about a project we did um, for the Marsco Institute for Early Li Learning and Literacy. They're based out of the University of Denver, um, and they do a lot of, they focus on uh, early childhood education. So most of the kids that they teach are three to four years old, um, and they focus a lot on developing curriculums that uh, help these kids learn concepts like math and counting, recognizing numbers, doing basic arithmetic. So we've done a number of projects for them. Uh, and they came to us asking for uh, sort of a, an assessment platform. Um, so what this would be is uh, an assessment would contain a number of sort of word problems. It meant it should be flexible, reusable, um, and most importantly, there are hundreds of test items. Uh, these test items are actually generated by grad students at DU who are trying to um, they'll develop little word problems and then create these into an assessment. <clears throat> the idea is that the, a teacher in the classroom will be able to take an iPad or a laptop and present it to um, one of these children and then begin an assessment. So um, remember, too, that since these are three- and four-year-olds, these assessments need to be very visual. A lot of them can't read yet, um, so the teacher will sit down and walk them through this assessment, they'll choose a student from their classroom, uh, and then begin the type of test that they want to do. So this platform is built entirely in Drupal. It keeps track of all the students, uh, allows the teachers to log in and see just their students and just their classes. Um, later there's a reporting feature so they can go back and look at the data and see how each student is doing on all these different attributes. So in the background it's pretty complex because each assessment is actually a series of tested items, as they're called, um, and then the path through this assessment is determined um, by their own proprietary setup. So whether the student gets an answer right or wrong leads them to the next question. Uh, decision tree, they call it. And so each student is meant to get the exercises that they've determined they need to um, help them do better at a given exercise. So potentially each student's path through this decision tree could be entirely different. And so that was something else that we needed to do in Drupal. We need to take their database, which is all just a set of zeros and ones based on wrong or right answers, that then score them and navigate them to the appropriate testlet item. So what they provided us was a series of enormous spreadsheets, like hundreds of rows of all these little graphics that their um, grad students had designed themselves, and then a script that was meant to be read aloud. So it would tell the student you know, what they're seeing, what they should be paying attention to, and then what the problem is that they're meant to solve. So out of this spreadsheet, we had to kind of parse through it and figure out um, what needed to happen. The graphic assets themselves were created by their department, so we didn't have any control over these, which was another challenge. Um, they were required to be interactive as well. And so they would include animations, reveals, highlighting. As the script was read, some parts of these graphics would need to be perhaps highlighted, maybe an arrow would need to flash, um, maybe a path would need to be traced to show what they were supposed to be paying attention to. Uh, so we needed to find a way to build a system that would allow um, them to create their own games, take these graphics that their department produces, and then make them clickable, make them animated. Now we'd done games before, um, but we'd done them differently because we built them ourselves. So they would give us a, a goal for each game and pretty specific criteria, 
But then we were free to create our own graphics, and we created our own animations and our own interactions, and we had total control over the logic. Um, we used a pro, uh, platform called Phaser, which is a JavaScript library for building games using the canvas. Um, so these games, we had a ton of control over, but we learned a few lessons about them. So for example, um, the games had things in common, like there would be a similar goal, like you'd have to do some sort of counting, but then the graphics themselves needed to be swapped out. So we learned a few lessons about how to separate some of the config from the gameplay and the content, and how to easily, or more easily, uh, replace assets and graphics, so that when the game levels changed, or when the client came back to us with different feedback, we were able to respond to that and modify them. Um, but again, with this project, we were gonna be giving up all of this. We wouldn't have any sort of control over the graphics. Um, we wouldn't have any control of the animations. And we had to figure out a system that would allow them uh, to sort of generate their own games. So some of the games that we'd made um, did communicate to Drupal already, but they were standalone apps. Like they were built in Phaser, uh, using Canvas, and everything was sort of self-contained. So since we had control over the assets, we were using things that Phaser did, um, like sprite animation. So like in this concentration game, that card flip animation is actually done with a sprite sheet. And so if you're not familiar with sprite sheets, it's basically just a large graphic that has all the frames of animation in it. And then you only show a small part of it at a time, but you, review, you sort of move the background around. And you could do the same kind of thing with CSS and background position, just moving a graphic in order to quickly sort of cycle through these frames of animation. The catch was, though, that for this game, there's a ton of these different cards. And so for us to create these, it was a bit time consuming, even though we kind of had a, a, we got used to it and we figured out ways to make it a little bit quicker. It's not the kind of thing you could ask someone to do if they weren't um, sort of briefed on it. So this type of animation, this kind of sprite animation, um, was far too precise and too fiddly um, to ask a grad student who maybe had very basic limited experience with Adobe Illustrator or something to be able to jump in and, and create something that was this specific and this repetitive and this consistent. So lessons that we learned from Phaser, we learned to focus on performance. So Phaser, uh, it does pretty well with things, but if you had too many sprites on screen at once, it, things would sort of bog down and slow down. Um, it's also a little bit monolithic, and so it had a lot of features that we didn't necessarily need for these games. Um, we also did learn, though, that config needed to be separate. So when we'd make a game, we'd do a bunch of variations on it. There'd be a bunch of levels of the concentration game or the counting game or the math games. And so we learned to keep all those options in sort of separate um, JSON objects so that they were easy to swap out and if we wanted to do something like change a color, you know, change a hover effect, that was just a matter of changing a single config line. So we learned a few things from this, um, and mostly it was to make everything configurable, make everything as reusable as possible, and then control that animation as dynamically as possible. So again, in Phaser, we were using things like the sprite animations, which were not dynamic at all. If you wanted to change the pace of it, or change the way something happened, um, it took a lot of rework, especially when you're using that same pattern over and over. So we were actually saved by SVG. Um, and this was something that we fell into um, almost by accident because knowing that the client had this requirement of drawing everything in Adobe Illustrator kind of put us in the mindset of vector art in the first place. So with Illustrator, you're able to ex export your assets as SVG. Um, I'm not gonna go too much into detail about SVG, but just some, some main advantages are that it's very lightweight. So compared, compared to bigger graphics, PNGs, JPEGs, it's a much smaller file, so it means it loads faster. Um, it's obviously scalable, that's what the S stands for in SVG. Um, and then it's selectable, which is key for us because an SVG element is like XML. And so it has things you're used to from HTML with IDs and attributes, and that means you can grab things in JavaScript and change their properties much more easily. Um, if you are interested in learning more about SVG animation, I recommend this book by Sarah Drausner. Uh, it's excellent, and it just came out a couple weeks ago, I think in March. And I really wish I would have had this six months ago when I was working on this because there's a ton of gems in this book that I didn't know about at the time and had to figure out for myself. So our client was using Illustrator, um, but I'm a much bigger fan of Sketch. It's super nice. I've been using Illustrator for a long time and I feel like the things that I've not liked about it have never gotten better. But Sketch sort of jumps in and, and handles a lot of things in a way that I appreciate more as a front-end developer. Um, what we Tried to, we had to train some of their GRAs on some very basic things, but the concept here is super simple. You draw a shape, um, and as long as you name that layer, I don't know if you can see that, but it's just, I just have three shapes in this example. As long as you name the layer, when you export that to SVG, it'll put that ID right in there. And so you can see the SVG is super simple. 
Um, it's just got the SVG tag, and then because those are rectangles, it's just a rectangle element. They have their position, their dimensions, and then in this case, just the fill as attributes. And those things are all adjustable either manually, if you open them up in a text editor, or with JavaScript, if you grab this object with a document, got el get element by ID. Um, if you are gonna use either Illustrator or Sketch for producing your SVGs, I really recommend using SVGO. You can, this is a node library and you can just run it from the command line, but there's also a plugin for Sketch and another one for Illustrator. So what this does, um, if you, especially Illustrator, but Sketch as well, will add a lot of comments and sort of cruft to your code. And you can configure your SVGO to trim a lot of that out and give you a much cleaner, very uh, succinct little snippet like that. Um, one thing to keep in mind though is if you are optimizing, sometimes they'll strip out IDs. And IDs in this case is what we relied on completely for actually doing our interactivity. So as far as interactivity goes, we used GreenSock for this project. And I'm uh, probably dating myself a little bit to admit this, but I used GreenSock back when it was an ActionScript library. Um, and back then it blew my mind. It was incredible. You could do all these things just with a few lines of ActionScript that would have been a real hassle on the timeline. I'm not gonna talk too much about that because it makes me feel super old. But I had forgotten about this and I came back to it when I started doing more research on this project and realized that this project's been going on this entire time and then they completely rewrote it for JavaScript. So it's a very uh, robust, fast, um, and effective JavaScript library. It's got a ton of tools. There's a free version. Um, the paid version we used for this because we had to do a few extra features like with Bezier paths, but the free version on its own is excellent and you can get a lot done with it. Um, it also does some interactivity. You can do drag and drop. Um, it'll fire up events. So it's super helpful when you're building your interactivity into your, into your applications. So back to Drupal. We had already built this site in Drupal. Um, and the idea was that every single one of these test items would be a node. So first of all, we wanted to make sure that we were managing all of our content and all of our configuration in Drupal as well, since all those scores needed to be saved back in there. Um, so we needed a way to upload the assets. Um, to define the actual sort of gameplay rules and patterns and interactivity, and then to generate the audio, because again, all of these lessons had to be read out loud for the students who um, hadn't yet learned to read. Um, so being Drupal, multilingual is super easy. It was um, very simple for us to just add in no translation and allow any of these test sets to be translated into another language. And the advantage here again is like, even if your graphic needs to look different and be sort of culturally adapted, or if you needed to change actual text that was in a certain language in the graphic or anything for whatever reason that needed to be different, those are all separate files, separate uploads. Um, and so creating a multi, uh, another language of this node is very simple. For uploading SVGs, we just used a file field. Um, so when you upload an SVG, um, the way that we set it up is that the SVG itself could be how the game appears, but it could also be used as sort of a sprite sheet. You could create elements and have them hidden by default so that you could use them later or you can use the use attribute. We didn't want to get too fancy with the SVG, we wanted to make it very simple because again, these were generated by um, outside people that we didn't have any way to train um, and you couldn't count on them knowing certain advanced features. So we tried to make everything very, very simple, like just basic shapes, um, just IDs, and then everything else needed to be handled by the JavaScript. <clears throat> so we parsed through our requirements and we looked at how um, that original spreadsheet defined these different levels. So every game or every level needed to have a correct answer, a prompt used, or a timer. And those are the, the basics. And so from the Drupal side, we just made a custom form. So each node had the ability to set some of its values by this custom form that you would see when you viewed it. And this was handy for our developers uh, because <clears throat> they were able to go through and test before we actually even built the JavaScript side of it. They could go through and test that decision tree and make sure that everything was routing the way they expected it to, that when they got something correct or incorrect, that those values were being saved, that they were being sent to the next correct test item, and that everything was functioning. So then once we came in and finished the JavaScript part of it, this form was hidden and all these values were entered by the student's interaction. Some of the graphics needed to be interactive. So we needed to actually target some shapes and say that these should be draggable, rotatable, um, various different things. In this case, the only two things we had to worry about were draggable and, and drag and rotation. So what we did is we created an entity reference on the testlet node itself, and that entity reference was for interaction. And so all this did was just have a text field that you could put in the ID, and then a dropdown where we could define the type of interaction. Um, so just by choosing that dropdown and identifying that ID, we could target that shape and make it something that you could click and drag on. 
Um, and likewise, since this is a multi-value text field, we could just add more options. So if we wanted to make it rotatable, you know, in this case 30 degree increments, but if later we needed 90 degree increments or we needed it to do something else, we could just add more options there and then write the code to, to respond to that. So it made it a little bit more future-proof. Um, then the last thing, or not the last thing, but one of the important things was the highlight types. So when the lessons are read, it would say something like, you know, which of these squares is, is bigger or which of these areas is greater. And while it said that, it needed to be able to highlight, you know, this square or this square or, you know, this distance. And so those things needed to be visually identified. So we, parsing through this spreadsheet again, we looked and we identified that there should be sort of a fill change. There should be a way of making a shape appear, making another shape disappear. They had some examples where they would say, look at this for three seconds, and then everything would disappear, and you'd say, how many, you know, apples were on the screen? So we had to build in these interactions, and again, it was just as simple as creating a dropdown and adding the ID so you could target each of these shapes for different behavior. The audio was a little bit of a different story. Just like interactions, we used entity references. So we just created a custom entity that had all the fields we needed. Um, in this case, again, um, we had a text field, which is just a plain old text area. You could type in the words that you wanted the game to speak. And then the audio field was just a file field, but you'd leave that blank. Um, then, again, you could highlight. So you could choose your drop down and your type of highlight, whether it was the color overlay, if it was a line that needed to be traced, et cetera. For the audio, we use the Watson API. And this is a super robust platform, and if, if you're at all interested in it, check it out. Watson was the AI that defeated, uh, was it Ken Jennings at Jeopardy? Um, and IBM has made this um, open, public. You can just register for an account. It's super cheap. Um, doing text-to-speech is practically free. It's like free for the first million characters, and after that, it's, it's pennies. Um, <clears throat> so what we did is um, our director of engineering, Joel Steidel, uh, created a small custom module which is a Watson API for Drupal. And what this lets you do is define a text field like I showed you in the last slide. And you type in your text, and it looks at the language that you've set, so in this case English, it grabs the text, and then it fires that off to the Watson API. And what it gets back is a re in a, as a response is just a WAV file. And what the, uh, Joel's Watson API will do is attach that returned WAV file to the audio file field. So now that, screen, that sort of script entity that we've created has the text that you, writ, that you wrote, but then the audio that you need it to be read is generated for you. And again, when we switch this node to Spanish, you just send that language request off to Watson, and it has a Spanish voice that pronounces things more or less correctly. Um, but yeah, definitely check this out. Uh, if you get a chance, it's just on our GitHub. It's not an official Drupal module yet. Um, but if you have any need for this, or you just want to check out how text-to-speech works, um, definitely download, download this module. And, Give Joel a tweet if you like it, um, or let us know. Um, so then the last thing uh, was the actual interface for the student. So most of these were just math problems, you know, how many apples are there, how long is this ruler, things like that. And so they could accomplish that with just a keypad. Um, and we designed sort of a calculator interface so that it was nice and, and touchable. It worked out for us because we hadn't originally planned to do uh, an iPad app, but once we converted this to be more mobile friendly, we didn't have to do anything here except to tweak some of the responsive styles. But you just punch in the numbers, it has a clear button just like a calculator, and when you submit, all it does is sets uh, the answer value to that number. <clears throat> this works exactly the same way as some of the other things I showed you. So that input method is just a drop down, it's just a multi value text field. So you can add other things. Like in this case, we did a multiple choice answer. This one is a little bit com more complicated because you had to have an entity reference. Each one of these answers had to have a name. It has an optional audio file as well. So the, when the student clicks green, orange, or purple, it'll read the audio file and actually speak the word. Um, and so we had a few other options. Like the, other, the third one that I didn't have an example for was just being able to click an object in the graphic itself to select it. Um, so the nice thing about doing this in Drupal is that everything is available for the Drupal settings object. So it isn't truly decoupled in that it's, you know, all the data is stored in Drupal and it's sending off to a completely separate front end. But what it was was more of an enhanced node page. So you take the page that has all of this data on it and you parse through all these entity references and you grab all the, uh, all the information you need. So in this case, this is the multiple choice answer entity reference that I mentioned just a minute ago. Um, so this is a fairly complicated 
entity reference, but we were able to parse through and grab all the things we cared about, which is just that it's, it is a multiple choice answer of that type. And then of the options, we have an ID, which is the, the shape ID, which isn't necessary in this case, but this refers to um, another field where you'd actually type in RG or RO. Um, and then you just type the text that needs to be displayed. And then in this case, it's a reference to the audio file that would be played when you click on it. And so we used this kind of format, this sort of a JSON object, um, just like we'd done with our own custom games before where everything was just written in JavaScript. Um, by putting all these config options into Drupal, we were able to export the JavaScript that we needed. So going through the entire game this way, we just grabbed like the ID, you know, the SVG file itself, which was um, grabbed and then actually imb embedded inline onto the page. And then uh, the correct answer, um, what the prompt would be, and then any sort of shape interaction, so the IDs, and then whether it's you know, rotatable or draggable, et cetera. Um, so here's just a, just a quick little single item in action. Um, and this is just, what this does is it opens up and you click the start button. We added a start button after the fact because with iPads, if you don't touch the screen, it doesn't autoplay audio. So we did this as sort of a, a way of tricking them into tapping the, the screen right before they begin the game. But then it also has the advantage of starting the timer so that we know exactly how long they took to solve this problem. And if they needed to take a break, go to the bathroom or something, they could just set it down and, and not, you know, not have to worry about the next exercise running too long. So in this case, um, we use the trace animation. So all those paths that the uh, grad students just drew with the pen tool and Illustrator are converted to Bezier's and then the uh, green sock library will trace the shape along it. Um, and then by making one of them clickable, you can have the student uh, choose the correct answer. So what was fun about this is that uh, I came back to this project a few months later to do some debugging and some QA, and there were hundreds of exercises of all different kinds, things that I hadn't even thought about. And so it was a super treat to see when things did work and you know, when they needed a little bit more tweaking, but seeing all these exercises filling in and um, you know, seeing this game kind of take on a life of its own was a real, a real treat. Um, so just a quick recap. Um, what we did is we just exposed the config for our game to authors. Um, we built some reusable patterns so that they could pick from a list of things that we knew were fairly predictable. Um, and then we layered new features on top of existing Drupal structures. So I hope that was helpful. Um, I know it was a lot to cover and it was kind of high level. I'm happy to talk to anybody later if you want to come down and find me at the booth or you can email me. Um, I'm going to hopefully do some blog posts about more technical sides of this soon, um, but I'm definitely happy to talk to you about it. And I'll post these slides up uh, later today.
Yeah, so... 